They teach us how to hate The people that we don't know But they don't know that we all came from one soul Okay, I'm now with this show With terrorists or my criminal You can blame a scapegoat But I pray for peace and not war I said I'm not with this show With terrorists or my criminal You can blame a scapegoat But I pray for peace and not war Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good evening and welcome to the special focus. I am Zahid Jadwit and we are together until 8 p.m. tonight right here on Salah Media once again. We are coming to you live via our live stream on salahmedia.com forward slash listen dash live on our Facebook page and on our YouTube channel as well as live on our Twitter page. Thank you so much for tuning in. Of course, one of the big questions around the upcoming 2020 United States of America their election is how the election will be affected by President Donald Trump being taken to hospital with COVID-19. Now, the president's health will be carefully monitored in the next few days and should be uh, and should he become seriously ill, it could significantly impact the election. His positive result already triggered a wave of speculation about what could happen to the U.S. government, the U.S. election, the handling of the pandemic, and much more. The virus has already dramatically affected the running of the election. This year, the Republican and Democratic conventions were unlike any other, with both parties avoiding the usual jamborees filled with thousands of supporters, party officials, and reporters from across the globe. It is also unclear what election day itself will look like, given the risk of catching the virus by voting in person. A record number of people are expected to vote before November the 3rd, which is the official election date, by opting for postal votes. Election experts suggest this could mean that the result may not be declared on election night, but may take several days or even weeks to emerge. So tonight we are going to try and find out what this election would be like uh, and why does it matter for the rest of us, especially as South Africans, taking note that the United States is a major role player on the global stage and a very influential power. Uh, so, of course, what happens there does uh, indeed affect us, whether directly or indirectly. And of course, many South Africans like myself might have limited understanding of this important event. So I do want to ask our experts tonight to give us an explanation as to what the election process is like in the United States. Interestingly, the founding fathers of the United States chose not to elect U.S. presidents by direct popular vote over fears that larger and more populous states could have an outsized role in deciding the winner. So when Americans cast their vote on November the 3rd, they technically vote for electors rather than the ca candidates themselves. But that's something we will get into um, in much more detail um, one of the differences between South African elections and the elections in the United States. In the meanwhile, let me introduce you to our list, uh, our guests rather for this evening. Firstly, we have Mr. Francis Konege, who is a, re a senior research fellow at the Institute for Global Dialogue. He's also an expert at the South African Institute of International Affairs. Good evening, sir, and welcome to the show. Uh, good evening. Yeah, I'm I'm, uh, I'm I'm a senior fellow at the Institute for Global Dialogue. Uh, uh, I'm not uh, formally associated with the uh, S South African Institute for International Affairs, although I do work with them. All right, thank you so much for that clarification. Um, let me also introduce Mr. Mara Naidu, who is a political researcher and a European Union Erasmus Mandus grantee at the University of Leipzig in, uh, in Germany. Uh, good evening and welcome to the show, ma'am. Having me. Good evening to you, listeners. Mm -hmm. We also have Mr. Herman Pretorius, who is the Deputy Head of Policy Research at the Institute of Race Relations. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, Herman. Good evening, Zaid, and it's really an honor to be with Tamara and Francis. I'm, I'm slightly intimidated by their expertise, but I'll try my best. <laughs> and last but no, not least, be. let me introduce Ms. Mr. Brooke Spector, who is an associate editor at Daily Maverick and is also a retired American diplomat. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. Uh, good evening. Good to be with you and the other panelists. I guess we have an enormous amount to cover and very short time to do it in. <laughs> Indeed, we will try to get to the bottom of this and we'll try to make it as interesting as possible. Uh, of course, time once again, not uh, on our side uh, this evening. 
So let's begin with you, Mr. Brooks Spector. Firstly, to put this discussion into perspective uh, and to help us get a better understanding of the topic, please do take us through the election process of the United States. I'm quite sure it differs vastly to the South African setup. Well, no, it, it is different. It's different by custom, it's different by law, and it's different by circumstance and history. Uh, and in, in very, very simple terms, uh, consider it as if there are 50 or actually 51 separate elections, uh, one for each state, one for the District of Columbia. And the idea is if you win that state's election, say you win California, which has a very large number of people in it, if you win it by just a few votes, you get the full population weight of that state. So that in this case, out of the 538 electoral votes that are possible, winning California gives you uh, 55, I think it is now, which is uh, well over 10% of the total available, uh, and so forth. And those three that process, you get 270 of them, and you have one. A part of the reason, just a footnote of history, part of the reason why this indirect system was picked um, well before there were actual uh, political parties in the United States, the idea of the, of the Constitution drafters was that they didn't actually totally and completely trust the power and the good sense of the mob, the mob being all eligible citizens, white, male, and property owners. And instead, they set up a series of interim intermediate steps, the Electoral College being one of them, presumably a collection of wise old men who would pick the best person. It has evolved over time so that virtually nobody knows any of the people who are electors, but when you go into the voting booth or look at your uh, ballot for advance or um, mail-in voting, you are effectively looking at the names of the presidential candidates. Not even You don't even, in many cases, see the names of the electors. And by and large, those electors that you have, uh, that are aligned with a particular candidate are almost always pledged to support that candidate. There are, there have been occasions when that has not happened, but that's a minor thing. All right. And the, the, the system as we have it now, November 3rd this year, first Tuesday in November is the date of the election. And Americans got used to the idea with the advent television that they would watch the election results as they come in and by late at night on the 11th on the uh, election day they would have a pretty good idea of who had won and that per the, the other person uh, would make his her phone call uh, to the winner and offer his her concession this year of course because of all the absentee uh, advance and mail-in ballots and the possibility that they will not all be counted by the end of the evening, Americans need to sort of settle themselves down with the idea that it's not going to be a decision on the 3rd of November. It might be on the 4th, 5th, or even the 6th by the end of that week. Uh, but it is also possible that if one candidate wins uh, strongly enough, there may still be the traditional concession speech by saying midnight on the 3rd. We don't know yet, uh, but I'm guessing on that one. Does that help you? Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for that uh, interesting uh, an, uh, explanation of how the elections works in the United States. I'm I'm pretty sure it's very much different, and I'm convinced it's different to the setup here that uh, of that here in South Africa, um, especially with that electoral college system uh, uh, being involved. It's very much different. But let's talk about what it is that Americans want at this point in time. Uh, of course, 2020 has shown us a lot. We've had the Black Lives Black Lives Matter protests. Um, we have, we've had COVID-19 come and sweep a whole lot of job gains uh, away. Um, so what are the key factors that will influence their decision at the polls this year? Uh, Mr. Konege? Uh, uh Well, I, I think that um, what, what you're seeing is something of a perfect storm of um, converging uh, uh, crises. Uh, you, you, you now, now the, the coronavirus, uh, uh, basically dominates and dominates the, uh, the landscape 
Um, uh, but with, within that, uh, you have had the uh, uh, the racial un unrest and poor and protests uh, generated by uh, a series of um, uh, of police uh, uh, killings uh, of un uh, of unarmed blacks, and there are any number of incidents that uh, continue. Uh, uh, to come, uh, you know, to, to, to come to light. Uh, and this has generated an ongoing uh, stream of, of, of protest, uh, which has become quite multiracial. Uh, that, it, it, uh, that has uh, in turn generated um, uh, certain uh, uh, sectors of Trump's uh, far right base among uh, militia uh, vigilante groups, um, uh, and and ever 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 since the Charlotte uh, uh, incident uh, in in 2017, uh, the these far right uh, uh, white supremacist groups uh, have been uh, in in the picture and have been and have become part of his base. So you have that, you have the impact that the uh, uh, coronavirus has had on the economy, uh, so that you have uh, you you have a, a major uh, economic uh, uh, crisis, um, and and the whole issue of stimulus, uh, and 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 that has all uh, become uh, 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 fault. These have all become fault lines. In a very uh, polarized uh, 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 situation between Democrats and Republicans, uh, and w which of course is reflected in 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 Congress, uh, you you put on that the high stakes issue of the Supreme Court. Um, uh, you know, so you have a so you have a a. A whole slew of major uh, crises that have come together, and uh, and and President Trump has basically stoked the divisions uh, instead of um, uh, instead of calming them, uh, which is in fact reflected in the way he has uh, handled his uh, getting the coronavirus himself. Uh, uh, he did not want to go to Walter Reed Hospital to, to begin with. Uh, he was more or less forced to go, and then he forced himself out, <laughs> and uh, ever since then has been pretty much uh, uh, weaponizing the whole experience, uh, uh, you know, generating, uh, you know, more, uh, more chaos uh, and uncertainty. In terms of how the coronavirus is uh, 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 should be handled, uh, so what what you have is a is a very de uh, is a house divided, uh, uh, so to speak. Uh, in in fact, you could almost put it in terms of a, a virtual uh, civil war situation of division, uh, where he has. Uh, drawn lines between uh, uh, democratic blue states and red states. Uh, Democrats are his enemies, and uh, so th this is this is a very uh, serious situation that we have with this election. And so, you know, as we uh, follow what is unfolding, we there are a lot of questions as to, uh, you know what kind of situation we're going to find uh, uh, during the election, post-election, uh, and, and so forth. Um, one, thing that, uh, one thing that I want to add, though, uh, kind of add on to uh, uh, what Brooks uh, mentioned about the election is that uh, it, it, it will take some time uh, probably to, to get a result. However, one state that I think may determine how quick, how quick or how long it will be could be Florida. 
uh, in the sense that uh, I, well, this is my own estimation. First of all, I'm not going to predict who's going to win Florida. I'll just say this, though, that Florida tends to uh, 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 come out uh, sooner than some of the other states, so that uh, if, uh, if, if Biden uh, ends up being the winner in Florida, then it, it, uh, that it, 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 then it's going to be very difficult for, uh, 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 for Trump to put together the 270 votes. And you can, you could almost, uh, more or less, uh, uh, speculate that the, the election is going, it, it will go to Biden. If, if Trump, uh, does win Florida, then it's going to be a longer night and it's going to shift to, uh, to the to the northern tier of Rust Belt states, Pennsylvania, uh, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin. Uh, now, some have also put North Carolina in there as well. But the thing is, is that both Florida and, and North Carolina are states that should go to Trump. Um, uh, so you know that that's the uh, that I think is the situation that we're looking at at the moment. Mm -hmm. And we will actually speak about what are your thoughts on uh, the outcome, what, what are you predicting for the outcome of this election. Uh, and also one of the questions I'd like to ask as well is uh, who exactly is able to lead the country and who might be the uh, best positioned uh, as, as a leader, who might be the best positioned candidate. Uh, but before we get to that, since you mentioned uh, Donald Trump's uh, hospitalization, um, there is a lot of speculation as to how the election will be affected by his hospitalization. Um, I'm sure the president's health will be carefully monitored in the coming days. And as some analysts have pointed out, um, should he become seriously ill, it could significantly impact the election. So what sort of impact do you think this has had on his campaign, his uh, infection with COVID-19? And who has got to lose and who has got to gain since this development in the build up to the election? Mr. Konege? Uh, can, uh, can come again. Can you just just repeat that? Mm. So I was speaking about uh, President Donald Trump having infected COVID nine, uh, contracted COVID nineteen, uh, and I was just wondering how this would impact the election and especially his campaign. So who stands to gain oh. from uh, from his? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Well, well, actually, I mean, it 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 has. Uh, uh, not not been very good for his campaign. I mean, it is pretty much uh, disorganized. It um, uh, and uh, he and his campaign have been forced to uh, make adaptations that they have resisted uh, for quite some time. And now they have to deal with the fact that uh, the uh, the impact of the coronavirus forces them to. Uh, do the kind of social uh, uh, social distancing, mask, and and other things that are needed uh, in in order to uh, to carry forth. Now, the Biden campaign is 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 organized from the get go on, uh, you know, on on proceeding on those terms. So, uh, and and the irony of it is that when the campaign really got got on the way, everyone was commenting on the fact that uh, Biden was campaigning from his from his basement in Delaware while Trump was out there on the road having rallies and so on and so forth now you've you have a situation that is almost vir virtually the res the the reverse since uh, since Trump Trump came down with the coronavirus uh, he has uh, uh, he you know he had to go into the hospital He's now in quarantine, more or less, uh, uh, in the in his White House uh, residence. Uh, uh, Biden and and his running mate Kamala Harris uh, are are out on the road. Um, so it's an interesting reversal of uh, of, of what you had. Uh, you know, so th this this is how things have. Have, have, have transformed, but clearly, I think that the that the coronavirus has uh, has has set back uh, the, the kind of momentum that Trump had 
had uh, had had counted on. Um, uh, now that does not that that still doesn't mean that uh, you know that he has that 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 he's necessarily going to lose. Uh, though the though the odds mm. seem to be you know pretty much uh, against him at this point, but uh, given the uh, uh, you know given the nature of our electoral system, as Brooks has has laid out, you can, you can't uh, you can't really make a a you know a solid prediction because everything at the end of of the day is going to uh, de be de uh, be determined by turnout. Now, if mm. if the turnout matches matches the polls, then you know mm. that that will determine it. Yeah, and I'm so sorry to interrupt you there, but uh, unfortunately, time is against us. And uh, Tamara and Herman, uh, I do hope you will excuse me. Um, we've got to release Mr. Brooks in a short while, and uh, he's going to leave us at about half past seven. So if I could just squeeze in uh, a final question or two for Mr. Spector. Um, so, um, Mr. Spector, uh, we were, Mr. Kodege was speaking about uh, the, the situation is pretty tense in the United States at the moment. Uh, so at this moment, who do you think is in a better position to lead the United States, Donald Trump or Joe Biden? Uh, I know this is a bit of a sticky question as well. So I'm going to try and get a broader perspective. So I'm going to ask one of the other mm. panelists to weigh in as well. Uh, but Mr. Spector, the, the platform is all yours for now. Well, ultimately, I mean, the choice becomes that of uh, circumstance and citizens. Uh, and in this case, if the polls are accurate, you know, what the footnote always is, polls are not predictive. There's, they're just a snapshot of what opinion is at that moment. And there's, there's, there is no clear way to use the polls to determine what the turnout will be. And as Francis says, uh, turnout's the key. But if the polling and all the polls point in the same direction, basically, uh, Joe Biden has a, what at this late date in the electoral cycle, has what, unless there is some strange and unusual thing that happens to him, uh, what is certainly a very solid lead, even in those swing states like Florida, um, he has a small, but still has a lead. If he is successful in holding it, the one thing I think we can say for, for certain is that uh, Joe Biden will be able to draw on an absolute wealth of experience, talent, people uh, from former previous government experience, people in business, people uh, in academia, in a way that uh, Donald Trump was unable to do. Uh, his cabinet and his uh, senior advisors and the heads of various other agencies would also almost inevitably look rather more like the rest of the country demographically, I mean, there was this one picture that was uh, of, the, of a White House meeting in the Trump administration called to discuss uh, women and minority issues. And if you looked at the table, they were all white men about 60 some years old, which said something right there. Uh, the Biden administration would clearly have a broader reach and expanse within it. Whether that ultimately generates better, more effective policies and decisions is a whole different question, and we can talk about that till, you know, till tomorrow morning. But I, I, mm -hmm. I, I think that if you look at international investment opinions, there is increasingly hey. consensus among investors that the that a Biden administration would be more effective in job creation and economic growth even more than the Trump administration likes to say it would be. So those are positives in the direction of Joe Biden. Will he win? Uh, well, call us later and we'll find out. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And interestingly, you mentioned about uh, the, the swing states. Uh, and for the sake of understanding, could you just uh, elaborate further on what exactly are these swing states uh, and what role do they play? Are they really that important, Mr. Brooks? Okay, well, the, 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 if we go back to our original explanation of the electoral vote and how you win states. Um, and the swing state concept simply means that historically, the voting in those states has been on such an even basis 
that it's hard to predict in advance that a state like Florida, a state like uh, now Colorado, a state like uh, uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, now Pennsylvania, uh, perhaps North Carolina, uh, possibly Arizona, uh, that these states are poised between the two camps and that depending on the issues and the people involved in the election, they will move, they could move one way or the other. And since those swing states also obviously have electoral votes, um, they will determine uh, who will win the election because most of the other states in the country, big and little, are already so clearly delineated between Democratic majorities or Republican majorities that it's those swing states that ultimately matter the most. Can I just add one other quick footnote? We talk about presidential elections, but the entire House of Representatives on 435 of them, a third of the Senate, in this case, 35 members of the Senate, and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of state, local, county, municipal offices are also being voted on across the country. And so it isn't just a, a question of who's going to win the presidency, it's who's going to win what Americans call down ballot, because you're not, mm. you're, you're not just saying, I want to vote for the president, you have the choice of voting the member of the House of Representatives, possibly the senator, maybe the governor, the mayor of the city you live in, right on through to the uh, the uh, possible dog catcher, municipal dog catcher. And so for most people, uh, they focus on the presidential race, but there are, by most estimates, something like 80,000, 80,000 electoral offices in the United States of all types and shapes. So the election itself is not just about the one event, even if that captures most of the attention by people domestically and internationally. All right. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Brooks Spector, Associate Editor at Daily Maverick and a retired American diplomat. Thank you so much for your contribution and your time. You go well. Take care. Thank you. I appreciate it. Now I'm going to go off to heal from an eye operation. <laughs> take care. Bye-bye. You Good do bye. take care. We do hope so. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, if you've just joined us, this is The Special Focus. My name is Ahi Jadid, and we are discussing the upcoming U.S. elections, and we are trying to find out uh, why this matters for us as South Africans. And we're just trying to understand uh, what exactly goes on in the U.S. election process. Um, and, of course, we had that really interesting um explanation by Mr. Bruce Spector. Uh, but Tamara, if I could just come to you now. The tenure of Donald Trump was, of course, a controversial one with many ups and downs. Uh, since his election as president, what exactly do you think has changed for Americans uh, and what has stayed the same? Take us through some of his successes and where he may have failed to deliver. Uh, maybe you could speak about the wall as well. He promised a wall between Mexico and America. That didn't happen. So just take us through some of these uh, th- these issues where he delivered and where he didn't. Sure. Well, you know, the thing with, with Trump is that um, if you look at, I looked at about 17 of his um of his campaign um uh, promises or commitments um and over his term how things developed and it's quite uh, surprising well to those who um you know if you're quite taken by his inflammatory comments and all of that you think that he might forget about this and uh, uh, uh and you know with inconsistency not pull through but out of 17 i found that he delivered on five and seven of them were partially delivered um, while well, the other another five uh, not so much. So I mean, the key ones that he's delivered on, for instance, are the tax cuts. Um, so he promised to lower uh, the corporate tax rate and bring in huge tax cuts for working Americans, and um, he has managed to do that. Um, he with, he brought the tax down from thirty five percent to fifteen percent, um, uh, and um, though uh, or. Um, and with that, though, uh, with the Republicans, they're saying that uh, future governments will renew tax cuts to individuals. So, uh, you know, that's uh, for those who were on that side of the fence. That's that's really great. Um, the Mexican wall, though, that's that's a funny one. 
Um, if any of you have watched uh, the Trevor Noah show or the John Oliver shows, they, they've uh, uh, done a lot of investigations into them. And yes, he has built some of it, um, but not without controversy. A lot of money has disappeared. Money was taken from uh, from defense budget budgets or budgets allocated to um, schools um, and the like. Um, and uh, unfortunately, though, the, the part that is new, um, that was not an existing wall, um, uh, that's a very small um, 100 and something, 194 miles um, that was newly built. So um, it's not, it's not, it's, it's a partial delivery <laughs> of his commitments. Um, the other ones that are interesting as well are, are for instance, um, uh, when you look at the Paris climate deal, I think that's a big one for all of us. Um, he promised that he was going to pull out because climate change is a hoax, and he stood it by it. Um, so even though the Paris deal is signed by over 200 countries in the world, um, the U.S. will officially exit on the 4th of November. So this is this is a big discussion, I think, that still need to continue for the rest of us of, of how we're going to look at climate change uh, without the U.S. as a, as a partner. Um, and of course, there's the issue of Supreme Court nominee. Um, I know it even reached South Africa in social media when um, Ruth Bader uh, Ginsburg passed away. Um, and uh, we had then um, Trump's nominee, uh, uh, come in who uh, is, is quite controversial in her own sense and that's besides the whole Brett Kavanaugh uh, appointments and Neil Gorsuch who as well uh, caused quite a stir in the media. Um, so uh, yeah it's uh, I wouldn't want to uh, speak too long but um, there are several uh, things that he's delivered on. Oh and another one is about bombing IS. He actually did do that um, and uh, that is something that was delivered. So he uh, dropped the biggest non-nuclear bomb in the US arsenal in Afghanistan. And so he took credit for driving IS out of parts of Iraq and Syria. Um, and um, arguably though that, that they were, this was a process already underway um, during Obama's um, reign, but uh, yes, it's, it's, we can still count that as a, as a delivery from Trump. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and, and that was quite accurate, you know, uh, coming up with those facts. And uh, I just love it when the guests make such a good contribution to the discussion. Um, but, but Herman, we know Trump was deeply involved in the business sector prior to his involvement in politics. Uh, what have these last four years or so taught us about Donald Trump, the politician? Oh my goodness! Uh, well, uh, firstly, let, let, let's let's take your your first uh, point there that he was, you know, a successful businessman. I I think that's a disputable claim. Um, it's it's always handy when uh, when you can get a few million dollars from your father to start a business. So I think that's handy. Um, so on on his business acumen, I, I I genuinely don't know. I don't think that's you know. He, it, it, it's it's part of his reputation and perception is so much of politics these days that I think he he weaponized that successfully and um, used it as part of his brand. Uh, what have we learned about Trump the politician? Well, um, I think one of the surprising things is that he has uh, been relatively consistent uh, with what he said he would deliver before uh, the election. I remember I remember during the Republican. A nomination fight in 2016, you had these questions whether Trump was really a, a conservative Republican uh, or really a Republican having uh, demo, uh, donated to Democrats for, for you know, much of the 80s and the 90s at least. Uh, and, and I think one thing that, that um, is clear that, that his, he, he stuck to his list um, of um, possible nominees to the um, Supreme Court uh, he nominated, with of course the help of organisations like um, the Fer Federalist Society, uh, a whole slew of uh, federal judges, um, influencing, I think, to a large degree, American jurisprudence for you know at least a decade or even more. Uh, some estimates, perhaps even going through a generation. So, uh, on that, he has been surprisingly consistent um, on issues such as abortion, where uh, Republicans did not trust him. 
uh, overly. He has um, yeah, stuck to uh, to many of his promises, um, and and so so I think what we can learn from um, the Trump as a politician is that he um, is surprisingly uh, consistent in 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 what he said he would stand for. Uh, when he was seeking the Republican nomination, but I must say that there's a any if 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 anyone elected Donald Trump to be presidential, then I think they um, weren't paying attention to much of the primary season in 2016. But what is um, interesting is that before the COVID-19 crisis, I would have said Donald Trump is clearly a very um, talented politician, uh, clearly knows how to um, set himself up for uh, some political dividends of, of his earlier investments. But of course, the COVID-19 crisis has uh, uh, you know, upset the apple cart in many ways. So I don't know if that really answers your question. I don't know if it's a question with a very definite answer about what have we learned about Trump, the politician, but mm -hmm. well, surprising consistency, it seems. Yeah, and you know, I had actually completely forgotten to mention earlier on in the discussion, I should have prior prioritized this question for uh, much earlier in this discussion, uh, is it's important to note that this year his uh, opponent is actually a different person. It's Joe Biden instead of uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, and of course, that was also an, uh, the 2016 elections, was uh, the build up to that was also a really heated and interesting uh, debate and a uh, whole interesting campaign of its own. Uh, Herman, wh what do you make of the difference uh, this time around? Now he's opposing jo uh, Joe Biden. Uh, so what do you make of the dynamics of this uh, contest? Well, I think, and, and I said this at the time, only Hillary Clinton can lose to Donald Trump and only Donald Trump could lose to Hillary Clinton. I mean, it, it would or two awful nominees. Um, and I, I think especially the Republicans must have been quite disappointed because they were supposed to have a, a quite deep bench. Former governors like Jeb Bush, promising young uh, senators like Marco Rubio, uh, red meat conservatives like Ted Cruz, um, you know, uh, bombastic governors from uh, purple states or even blue states like Chris Christie from New Jersey, who was then governor of New Jersey. I think um, the... The, the, the change was that Clinton was an incredibly weak candidate uh, for the Democratic Party, um, and, and she was very much disliked. I think the 2016 election still holds the unique qualifier of being an election between the two most disliked presidential candidates, um, at least from the polling that I've seen. So how how the, the fact that it's Joe Biden, not Hillary Clinton, is make complicates um, uh, Trump's uh, um, situation, because I think many people um, looked at Clinton and uh, I think she inspired intense dislike, where I think Joe Biden just doesn't inspire uh, that same level of vehemence from his political opponents. So if you look at what happened in, in states like Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and Michigan that Trump carried in 2016, I mean, he won those on a turnout error, mostly uh, because People couldn't be um, Democrats, especially black Democrats uh, in, in the urban areas around Pencil in Pennsylvania specifically, couldn't be bothered to show up to vote for Clinton the way they voted uh, for Barack Obama four years previously. So the fact is, he's not as scary. So I don't think he's as a polarizing figure. Um, and he might even do better among uh, black Democratic voters than Clinton did because he... Um, uh, he does have working class, you know, uh, a level of working class appeal, urban appeal that might actually uh, appeal to, 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 to black voters and Hispanic voters who themselves uh, are in many cases middle class, uh, not middle class, working class, aspiring to become middle class. But then you also uh, sit with the situation that last time um, you can... If, if Trump won on a turnout error, well, not error, if Trump won on turnout in 2016, that's a trick you only get to pull once. If I could jump in here. Mm -hmm. that... Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, sure. Another important factor has been, of course, that Trump has been uh, bringing up a lot of doubt in terms of um, uh, the credibility of the election system itself. 
And, uh, you know, besides the mail-in ba ballots that, that have already been mentioned, uh, in 2016, a big factor, of course, was uh, um, foreign interference in the elections. And uh, a lot of research has come up since then. Um, so in this election, uh, there's been statements from uh, Christopher Rye, who's the FBI director, oh, sorry, the director of uh, National Counterintelligence at and security center. And uh, I mean, he said that uh, in uh, recent times that Russia, China, and Iran were all caught trying to interfere um, in this November 3rd election. Um, they found that they've dismantled, Facebook itself has dismantled three botnets uh, that were trying to propagate false information. Um, two are from Russia, one from Pakistan. Um, so it seems that they are quite active in, in engaging fake news. Um, however, that is, of course, in all of our countries, um, something, a phenomenon that we are trying to contend with. And I hope with this election um, that there have been lessons learned and incorporated that they're able to respond much more swiftly to election interference and fake news, especially. Yeah, and in fact, you've just brought up an interesting topic to discuss here. And unfortunately, we don't have that much time. But uh, if we could just scratch the surface of it. Um, Foreign interference is how likely is that uh, this year in the November third elections? Tomorrow? Well, I, I do. I, according to um, this National Counterintelligence Security Center, also uh, fake news circulating amongst right wing media or around circles like the Three Percenters um, and um, the Boogaloos, I believe they're called. Um, the FBI, FBI and other uh, homeland, other domestic agencies in the US are looking at these domestic terrorist circles uh, much more intently. They've actually uh, caused uh, three, uh, two thirds of attacks in the US since 2019. That is uh, two thirds, while one third have been, you know, other uh, actors such as, um, you know, leftists or Islamic motivated uh, attacks in the US. And um, so uh, the fake news is something that is being fought from an international uh, angle, but also from a domestic one as well. And I believe the Daily Maverick even had uh, something about uh, QAnon um, and its roots in South Africa. So it's it's amazing how in this global world we're all interacting um, in the uh, in the elections. Mm. And like you said, we do hope that uh, lessons have been learned from the 2016 election campaign um, and the 2016 elections in general uh, when it comes to foreign interference. And I think um, we will in time see how this plays out. Uh, but Mr. Kunage, coming to you now, of course, a big part of the general perception of President Donald Trump involves the way he treats minorities. Uh, he is the leader after all. Uh, so how has the African-American population responded to Trump's campaign? Of course, uh, it might be much more difficult for him this year to appeal to this, uh, to this sector of the, uh, the population of the United States, of course, because um, of his opponent, uh, Joe Biden, now having announced Kamala Harris as his, uh, as his uh, deputy. Uh, so how do you think the African-American population has uh, responded to the campaign? Mr. Kornigay? Possibly, possibly as much as Mr. Kornigay is responding now. Uh, can you guys hear Mr. Kornigay? Because uh, actually, I, I really can't hear him. No, I think he's frozen. I Okay, uh, so we'll try to get a better connection with Mr. Konege. But uh, in the meantime, would any one of you like to take over that question? Might I? Uh, I, I think something that's very interesting is the Republicans uh, traditionally garner about, you know, 8 to 10 percent of the black vote in America. And uh, President Trump got 8% in, in, in 2016. And, and I did some rough calculations. And to my mind, it seems that if he could in it, if he manages, um, that's a big if, to push that uh, percentage from eight up to 14, which would essentially amount to a doubling of his support, then I would, I, I think he has, a, he stands a good chance of winning Pennsylvania. And if he can win Pennsylvania, I think he probably wins the election. Um, the interesting thing is that uh, Trump's approval among African-American voters, um, I've seen estimates of it being as high as 24% uh, approval rating uh, to 12% approval rating. And I think something along in the, in the region of 12% is perhaps more a realistic figure. 
But that does say something quite um, interesting, that uh, Mr. Trump seems to have increased if these polls are, if these support polls are accurate. And I, I do think some of them have a claim to some merit. Um, he, he has managed to increase his African-American support by 50% since 2016. Um, the reason for that, I think, would be hidden in the jobs data, where uh, before COVID-19, um, uh, Hispanic and African American unemployment figures were actually looking quite um, quite good for for the Trump administration. I think yeah. so. Thank you so. Much. Yeah, Tamara. Tamara uh, if you could just please keep it as brief as possible, because we just have about five or six minutes remaining. Sure. Well, um, I mean, the, the U.S. economy has been uh, improving uh, since the crash in 2008, 2009. So there's no doubt there's been increase in terms of employment. Um, but of course, the latest statements, for instance, at the pre last presidential debate uh, with Trump uh, not wanting to outright condemn right wing violence and even the Republican Party members afterwards trying to backtrack and say, oh, he misspoke or trying to find excuses for that. It is quite a loud statement uh, by um, his omission uh, on, on uh, to condemn uh, the right wing violence. Um, and this also keeping in mind in terms of um, civil death in America. So if you've gone to jail, some states you're not allowed to, to vote at all. So there's about six million Americans who don't vote. And it's also well known that a large number of of inmates are uh, African American or Black American, um, and uh, let's not forget about um, Hispanic people as well. Um, of course, they're a heterogeneous group. Some of them don't think of themselves as people of color, but all of these play as well um, in, uh, you know, potentially going for a de Democrat or Republican uh, um, demographics, voting demographics. Indeed. And of course, one of the main questions which I wanted to ask uh, in this uh, tonight's discussion is why exactly does American politics and elections matter to the rest of the world, particularly South Africa? Uh, we know that America is an influential uh, country. And of course, whatever happens there does affect us directly or indirectly, as I mentioned earlier on. But Tamara, if you just want to elaborate on that, perhaps. Sure. Oh, so, yes, of course. I mean, with our economies intertwined, it's uh, critical that when there's confidence in the elect in the U.S. and its um, and its governance, it means that there is also um, investor confidence, uh, which ensures that there's a continuity. For instance, in currency. So, one of the benefits of Trump were to be uh, elected is that emerging markets, our currencies, would have would be buffered for some time. Whether uh, the U.S. makes favorable economic policies or international trade, that's another question. But in terms of continuity, continuity that would assist us. Um, but of course, um, there are a lot of geopolitical um, fights going on at the moment. One of them around Germany and Nord Stream 2, a gas pipeline between Russia and Germany. Um, and that's causing a lot of contestation with the U.S. right now. The U.S. is also embroiled with China um, in the trade wars. I mean, it seems to be diffusing. And even if he were to be elected, it seems that things would improve. Um, but this also uh, means that China, for instance, is having to buy something like um, uh, 200 billion worth of products from the US to make good on that deal. And uh, that means that countries, for instance, like Germany move out, uh, lose out because they're, um, they have their markets, it shifts the market, markets. Um, and uh, it'd be, that means that there are going to be repercussions for all of us when the US sneezes, you know, we all feel to get a cold. That's what they say. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for that. Just briefly now, if we could wrap up this discussion, um, what exactly, Herman, is the likelihood of re-election for President Donald Trump? Uh, what sort of outcome are you predicting? Well, at least you're giving me the easy questions. Uh, no, it's, <laughs> it, it's, I, I, the the odds on the election, I, I think um, only a fool, uh, especially after um, Trump's election and Brexit, uh, you you know only very very brave or very very foolish people make those kind of calls. Uh, for my mind, um, I can't I, I I can't see Trump winning. Um, a few things might still happen in these last few weeks, um, and and as as a South African, I think. Um, 
Republicans traditionally have been better for the African continent, if you look especially uh, to George uh, W. Bush's PEPFAR projects and the like. And then if you compare it to the Obama policies surrounding, uh, especially Sudan, I mean, the, the the comparison between uh, the Obama administration's approach to Sudan and the Bush administration's approach to Sudan. I think the Bush administration really put a lot of work in there that um, that the Obama administration just failed to capitalize on. And I think Sudanese, um, you know, Africans are paying the cons- are paying the price uh, for for those things. And I think tomorrow is right when when the U.S. sneezes. Um, the rest of us catch a cold, but uh, in in 2020, it seems at least when you know when a pangolin sneezes, the whole world catch a cold and catches a cold in some way. But I can't see Trump winning. Um, I think it would be better for South Africans on things like property rights if Trump won. Um, his State Department has made a lot of positive noises on things like property rights, where um, noises from uh, democratic equivalents are perhaps, you know, less encouraging. I think it would be good for Africa if Trump won. Uh, I I can't see him doing that. But um, uh, an interesting little caveat is um, the Senate. The Senate is really where I think the most important decisions will be made. If if I'm right in thinking Joe Biden is likely to win, then it will come down to will the Democrats have uh, control of the Senate? If they do, then you can expect a quite radical uh, Harris, uh, Biden, Harris presidency. If the Republicans hold on to the Senate, then I think you will see Joe Biden of old, who is actually quite a centre-left um, centrist in a way that is uh, perhaps even more palatable to Middle America than Clinton was. So, I think the presidency will go Biden. The question in my mind is: um, Do the Republicans manage to um, hold on to the Senate, especially with states like Iowa and North Carolina? Uh, being some of the important mm. states to watch there. May I just may weigh in there? All right, thank you so much. And yeah, tomorrow I'll give you an opportunity right now, but I was just going to say it is unfortunate that Mr. Uh, Mr. Francis Kunike has uh, been unable to rejoin us because uh, his contribution in this aspect would have also been really interesting. But tomorrow, your final thoughts. Uh, can, can you for see? Herman, he doesn't see Trump winning, but uh, can, can you see what, me what now? outcome are you predicting? Oh, yes, hi. Mr. Kodege, I Hello? can see you now. Yes, oh, Mr. Kodege, okay. can you hear us? <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, do, do you want me to to respond? Uh, I'll give you an opportunity now, but uh, I see Tamara is waiting okay, to give sure. a response uh, to this. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. No, okay. Uh, I just wanted to to just just uh, disagree uh, with Herman. Um, just in terms of how Africa is treated between the Republicans and the Democrats, sometimes it's better, sometimes it's worse. They tend to have similar interests around uh, security capacity, building it in Africa, or integrating Africa into global markets, health and such things. But it's not. Um, you can't see that much of a difference or that one is better than the other. Um, In terms of Trump though, of course, he's the wild card. And I think that in the sense of multilateralism to make fairer deals, having a WTO that works, these are things that we need to value as global citizens. And unfortunately, I do think that is in the Biden camp and uh, we'll have to see who gets it in the end. (laughs) All right, thank you so much for that. Mr. Konege, your final thoughts. Uh, what do you see in, uh, in the out- outcome for the 2020 elections? Well, uh, this might be wishful thinking, but uh, I'm hoping that, uh, that, that Biden will win and that uh, uh, the Democrats will be able to uh, retake the Senate. Uh, if, uh, if, if, if we're looking at a second term of uh, Trump, then it's, it's, a, it's really a disaster. Uh, because um, uh, the U.S. is in a situation, and this, uh, th- which it has been in for a long time, where there's a lot of domestic renewal that has to happen, and that will never happen under a Republican administration. Uh, they don't believe in government; they believe in in tax cuts, <laughs> uh, uh, mainly for the rich, uh, and. Uh, and what what Biden will do inter- internationally is to de-escalate, uh, de-escalate the uh, the t- the tensions uh, that have been generated. Um, uh, and for Africa, it would be particularly important uh, to have a 
Democratic administration, given the fact that under Trump, what Trump is basically doing is tying uh, Africa to the Middle East uh, uh, in terms of the geopolitics of 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 of, uh, of normalization with uh, with Israel. So so Africa is basically when you put together the U.S. Uh, uh, Netanyahu's government in Israel, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, and UAE. Uh, he is the, the, uh, his administration is transforming Africa into a subordinate uh, continental subsystem to uh, a, a a a very uh, dangerous uh, a Middle East uh, agenda. Uh, so I, 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 so the stakes, as far as Africa are concerned, are very high, and um, and, well, and I, so yeah. uh, one hopes. Uh, well, I do anyway that uh, that Biden will really will, will will and the Democrats will prevail, but we'll see. Mm. Okay, I think it's really going to be interesting to uh, see what uh, how this unfolds. Of course, uh, just a few more weeks until the May election day, but uh, uh, of course, everyone is keeping an eye on this. Uh, thank you so much to all of you for your time and contribution, Mr. Francis Konegay, Senior Research Fellow at the Institute for Global Dialogue, Tamara Naidu, Political Researcher and European Union Erasmus Mundus grantee at the University of Leipzig in Germany. Herman Pretorius, Deputy Head of Policy Research at the Institute of Race Relations. And of course, earlier on, we had Mr. Brooke Spector, who is an associate editor at Daily Maverick and a retired American diplomat. Thank you all for your time and contribution. Uh, to the listeners, do stick with us. We are going to take a quick break. And when we get back, we are going to speak to Ms. Lee Zama, who is the CEO of FEDASA. Uh, that's the Federated Hospitality Association of South Africa. Uh, we are going to speak about the travel industry's preparedness for the December holiday. Day season. Please do stay with us. Okay. Bye.